This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. The news bulletin back in 1997 would likely have assumed from the strength of the report and with a suspect publicly identified that the wheels of justice would turn and before too long the dashing English poet living on his Irish plot of land would be tried in an Irish courthouse and end up behind bars. I probably assumed the same until I read a piece in The New Yorker by Irish-American poet John Montague. By that time, four years had passed since Sophie's murder. I was surprised to learn that the Irish police investigation had stalled. Ian Bailey had been arrested twice, and detectives had come calling at his home on many occasions, but he had never formally been charged with the murder of the beautiful Frenchwoman. Montague had employed Bailey casually as a gardener, and painted a picture of the Englishman that was hardly complimentary. He was violent, narcissistic, and unpredictable. For good measure, Montague was also critical about Bailey's gardening, and the bunch of poems Bailey had subjected to Montague's expert opinion. My interest was piqued, so I delved more into the story. Several things stood out. Bailey had an alibi that was almost comical in its uselessness. There was no DNA evidence to speak of, and Sophie's mother was on record as saying that she believed Bailey had killed her daughter. For his part, Bailey had repeatedly insisted that he had never known Sophie Toscan de Plantier. As for the victim, it seemed the more she had played down her beauty, the more men had found her attractive. Her backstory was enigmatic, but troubling, too. I was intrigued by the unsolved murder on the Irish moors, but it dropped off my radar. What intervened was my life, marriage, two sons, earning a living, moving house a couple of times, eventually relocating back to Belgium. Then one day in November 2014 I got a call from an Irish friend who knew I had an interest in the Sophie case. He said, Bailey is suing the Irish state. He's about to appear in court in Dublin. Within a couple of hours I had bought a plane ticket to Ireland. I wanted to meet Ian Bailey. I wanted him to tell me his story. This was an excellent opportunity, and I had to strike while the iron was hot, if that is an appropriate expression for introducing myself to the long-term suspect in a cold case. The basic thrust of Bailey's date in court was in every Irish newspaper. Bailey claimed that the Irish police had engineered a massive stitch-up, and he had been fitted up for a crime he had not committed. Like I say, when a good mystery gets under your skin, it has a strength all of its own, even if it lies dormant for years. I write these words in lockdown in May 2020. My manuscript, the book you are reading, is nearing completion. For many of us, the onslaught of the coronavirus pandemic has turned our gaze inwards. Where did we go right in our lives? Where did we go wrong? When life returns to something approaching normality, what will we change? What, finally, have we learned? Over dinner one night, the last shafts of pale late spring light bouncing off the cobbles in the square in front of our apartment, I ask my sons a question. It is partly to relieve the monotony of weeks cooped up indoors, partly because I'm interested to hear what they think. Is it right to pretend to be somebody you're not? Let's say when something important is at stake. What I mean is, should you ever be a bit false to somebody to find out a bigger truth. The boys understandably gave me a blank look. I'll give you a specific example, OK? Say you could make someone feel better and maybe, just maybe, take away some of the pain they have felt for a very long time, but you need to pretend to be someone else for a while if you're going to succeed. My sons are thirteen and ten. The younger one shoots back. You're talking about Bailey, aren't you? I do not deny it. Papers on the Sophie Toscan du Plantier murder case, police statements, press cuttings, scribbled notes are strewn around our home. My sons, and my wife too, can see that I have been living the story, inhabiting the puzzle.
The boys think for a moment. No, they say, they don't see how that would work. You should all...